going to be looking at Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing, one of his most delightful and well-loved comedies, particularly for the fantastic witty banter back and forth between Beatrice and Benedict. The play is about love, but it's also about social tensions, particularly the tension between duty and honor and shame. We're playing love games, or we're playing them with very high stakes. Matching and manipulating are both important ideas throughout this play. Notice the way Benedict and Beatrice are matched together through the manipulation of their friends. At the same time, the malcontent Don John manipulates what appears to be a perfect match between Hero and Claudio. This play is so much fun, especially because of the language. I mean, that's nothing new for Shakespeare's plays, but the witty wordplay games back and forth, particularly between the characters Beatrice and Benedict, never cease to delight. Beatrice is one of the best roles for women in all of Shakespeare. She plays herself off as light-hearted and merry, but there's a deeper edge to her that goes sometimes unnoticed by her friends, or at least uncommented upon in their social etiquette. Both she and Benedict refuse to marry and fall in love. The play begins with a whole bunch of soldiers returning from war where they've had lots of success, and so now they're going to play love games. And these love games become a kind of war in and of itself. Spying, attacking, taking captive. All this kind of language comes out throughout the play. Claudio and Hero are matched together as a good social match. They work well on the social strata, and so they're the perfect couple. But Claudio is easily manipulated into thinking that Hero has betrayed him. He goes out and does the most audacious thing possible in revenge, shaming her during the wedding ceremony. In a world where public shame is the absolute worst possible punishment, this is outrageous and goes so far as to kill her, apparently. And goes so far as to apparently kill her. Notice the way her father is so horrified by this that he just hopes she'll die because the shame weighs too much both on her and on him. Although he seems incredibly unsympathetic in that moment, we see him as a more complex character throughout the play, and we feel the weight of social stigma in that moment. Benedict is able to endure the shaming of his friends in their happy mockery of his ultimately falling in love, but only because he has completely fallen to the social ideal. The lover who's pursuing marriage and writing these sonnets to his beloved, everything one would expect of a lover. And after all, they're the ones who have manipulated him into this position, so he doesn't feel their good-natured jibes. There are plenty of moments when duty creates tension, though. When Benedict has discovered love, and he knows that he loves Beatrice, and then she asks him to kill Claudio, there are layers upon layers of tension. Benedict and Claudio used to be fast friends. Benedict feels loyalty to his prince, Don Pedro, who has a hand in the defaming of Hero. And so when Beatrice asks him to kill Claudio, he has to, for the duty of love, face off his old friends. These characters are so intensely socially conscious and stuck on what the fashion of things should be. Although Beatrice and Benedict seem like their own independent figures, ultimately they are pushed into a relationship. At the end, when neither will claim great love for the other in public, they're still coerced into marriage by their own bad love poetry. They've written love poems to each other, as lovers should do. They fell into the pattern of things, and with each other's love letters in hand, Benedict says, A miracle. Here's our own hands against our hearts. Come, I will have thee. But by this light, I take thee for pity. And Beatrice answers, I would not deny you, but by this good day, I yield upon great persuasion, and partly to save your life, for I was told you were in a consumption. Whether this is just a continuation of their constant wit against each other, or whether they are really not in love but being coerced to into it by the form of the thing, is not entirely clear. And yet everything else is so charming and so fun that we want them to be in love at the end. Benedict mentions in an earlier scene, Thou and I are too wise to woo peaceably. They can't help but tease each other. And even earlier in the play, when Don Pedro first introduces the idea of pairing Benedict and Beatrice, Leonidas says, My lord, if they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. What's their marriage going to be like? In one way, they're incredibly socially suited. They're both a pair of wits. Their relationship is endlessly entertaining, and their love life at least will be that. However, unlike many of Shakespeare's other comedies that have a dark and more serious undertone, this play continues to remain lighthearted. Even Don John's manipulation of Claudio into thinking that his future wife is unfaithful ultimately is undone by a team of buffoonish policemen. And when the worst manipulation is so easily unraveled, there's nothing too heavy. 
Of course, we have similar plots in both Cymbeline and Othello, plays that weigh us much heavier. It's worth comparing the difference between the comic plot of Claudio and Hero to the romance of Posthumus and Inigen, to the tragedy of Othello and Desdemona. But let's look at the plot here. Act 1 opens with the news that the soldiers are arriving at Leonato's house. We quickly establish both the glory given to the young officer Claudio, as well as Beatrice's merry war with words with Benedict. The soldiers arrive immediately after the messenger, and Beatrice and Benedict begin their witty battle. We also discover the character Don John, Don Pedro's brother. Don John has fallen out of favor with Don Pedro, but been reinstated. However, Claudio's got all the glory, much to Don John's annoyance. Don John is clearly antisocial, and not particularly interested in putting himself in everyone's graces. Benedict and Claudio get a moment alone, and Claudio confesses that he's fallen for Hero, much to Benedict's annoyance. Benedict thought Claudio would stick by him as forever bachelors and Benedict continues to tease him until Don Pedro comes in. Benedict then tells Don Pedro, hoping that Don Pedro will tease Claudio with him, but Don Pedro decides to help Claudio out in his quest for Hero. Don Pedro is going to go to Hero in disguise and woo her for Claudio. We then have a brief scene between Leonato and Antonio, his brother, who are talking about the possibility that Don Pedro will be wooing Hero. There's a lot of social pressures. After all, all these soldiers are quartering in Leonato's house, and Leonato makes these great protestations to Don Pedro, which Don Pedro returns. Oh, I'm so happy to have you in my home. No, it's no trouble, no trouble, no trouble. The intense focus on hospitality. Meanwhile, we get to know Don John. Don John, as we said, is the illegitimate half-brother of Don Pedro, and he's chatting with Conrad and Baraccio about how much he hates everybody and everything. Conrad suggests that Don John play it cool for a little while and try to smooth things out between him and his brother, but Don John says, no, I hate being nice, I want to make trouble, let's cause mischief. Baraccio, having overheard Don Pedro and Claudio talking about Hero, finds an opening. Let's mess with Claudio's head. After all, Don John particularly hates Claudio. Now that we've introduced our characters and our general problems, we move on to Act 2. Scene 1 is after dinner, as Leonato and Antonio talk with Beatrice and Hero about getting them husbands. We lead in, after this, to the masquerade, where characters put on masks and begin to chat and dance with each other. It's a big party. Don Pedro, of course, sidles up to Hero in order to woo her for Claudio. There are lots of other little conversations going on back and forth in the background, most notably, Beatrice and Benedict. Benedict pretends to be someone else, and Beatrice insults him, calling him the Prince's Jester. His feelings are very hurt as he slumps off. Don John uses this opportunity to sidle up to Claudio and say that he's seen Don Pedro wooing Hero not for Claudio, but for himself. When Benedict comes back in to tell Claudio that Hero has been won, Claudio is so sulky that he stumbles off. Benedict continues to sulk about the fact that Beatrice insulted him, and when Don Pedro comes looking for Claudio to tell him the good news, Benedict can't help but unload all of his frustrations about Beatrice. When Beatrice walks into the room, Benedict asks Don Pedro to send him anywhere in the world so long as he doesn't have to stay in the presence of this harpy. When Don Pedro asks him to continue in good company, Benedict grumps off. Beatrice, however, has dragged mopey Claudio in to speak to Don Pedro. Don Pedro tells Claudio that Hero is one for him, and Leonato gives his blessing to Hero. Claudio is taken aback and overwhelmed. Ah, love! Beatrice teases everyone and seems so merry and happy, but there's a sort of sentimental sad side to her. As she exits, Don Pedro comes up with a plan to while away the time until Claudio and Hero can be married. They're going to trick Benedict and Beatrice into falling in love. Sounds like a pretty fun and complicated game. In scene two, we see Don John, whose first attempt to frustrate Claudio has come to naught. But Baraccio has another plan. You see, one of the waiting maids on Hero, Margaret, is in love with him and will do anything for him. And so Baraccio is going to ask her to dress in Hero's clothes and meet him at Hero's window the night before the wedding. And he'll call her Hero. Don John will bring Claudio and let him see what looks like an affair between Hero and another man. Meanwhile, in the orchard, Benedict is griping about Claudio turning into a whipped lover. When he sees Don Pedro and Claudio coming, he decides to hide so he doesn't have to bear hearing more about love. They play some love music, though, and immediately afterwards they begin to talk about how Beatrice is madly in love with Benedict, but how she can't tell him because he'll just scoff at her. 
They go on and on expressing their pity for her, praising her virtues, and shaking their heads at Benedict's hardness. After they leave, Benedict steps out and believes him everything that they've said, and decides that if Beatrice is in love with him, then he should fall in love with her. When Beatrice comes out to invite him to dinner, he overanalyzes absolutely everything she says in a comic way, taking it all as hidden love messages for him. And so we reach Act 3. In Scene 1, Hero and her maids Margaret and Ursula play the same prank on Beatrice, causing her to hear that Benedict is in love with her. She also accepts their story and decides to fall in love with Benedict. In scene two, Claudio and Don Pedro tease Benedict a little bit because he looks like he's fallen in love, although he claims he's just got a toothache. However, shortly after this, Don John catches the two of them and tells them how he's overheard that Hero has been unfaithful, how she's been sleeping around every night, and how he has proof to show Claudio. In scene three, we introduce some new characters, The Watch. Dogberry is an absolute buffoon who, with his partner Virgis, can never say anything that he means. In fact, most of the time his words are the exact opposite of what he's trying to say. He's also completely incompetent, as his charge to the rest of The Watch shows. As an aside, in the wonderful Joss Whedon film of this play, Nathan Fillion is the most perfect Dogberry ever. However, somehow, his watch manages to overhear Baraccio and Conrad talking about what Baraccio has done, and how Don John has given him a thousand ducats to destroy Hero's name, and how Claudio is now going to shame Hero at the wedding tomorrow. The watch arrests the two of them and brings them in for questioning. In scene four, Hero is preparing for the wedding with Ursula and Margaret, and in comes Beatrice, and they tease her again roundaboutly about Benedict. As Leonardo walks to the wedding, Dogbury and Verges stop him to try to tell him about the men that were caught by the watch. However, they're so horribly inarticulate that Leonardo finally dismisses them and asks them to examine the men themselves. And so a crisis is not averted. Act 4 begins with the wedding, which is of course a disaster. When the friar asks if there is an impediment, Claudio halts the wedding to demand if Hero knows of one. When she says no, he turns to Leonardo and says, Do you give your daughter to me in good faith? When Leonardo says, Yes, of course. Claudio says, Well, what can I give you in return of equal value? And Don Pedro says, Nothing except for that you give her back again. And so then Claudio shoves her back to Leonardo and says, Fine, I'm not taking her because I know what she is. She's been sleeping around. Claudio, Don Pedro, and Don John tell what they've seen at her window the night before. Leonardo is horrified and takes their word for it because of their honor. Hero faints away for shame and Claudio and Don Pedro storm out. Leonardo is so torn up he wishes that his daughter would just die because the shame is too great. Beatrice is horrified by Claudio's behavior as well as Leonardo's response to it. Benedict, who wasn't really involved in any of this, is trying to calm everyone down, especially Leonardo. Finally, the priest stands up and gives some advice. He points out how innocent Hero looks and how confusing all these details are. He advises that they pretend that Hero is dead, because it looked like she was dying when the Count and Prince walked out. And if she's dead, it will detract from some of the shame that's bearing down on their family, at least until they can straighten all this out. And so they all exit, leaving Benedict and Beatrice behind. Beatrice is reeling from the shock of all this. And Benedict is swept up in the emotion as well. He wants to do something for Beatrice because he's of his newfound love for her, but he doesn't know what to do or say. And he winds up confessing his love to her. She discovers that she can't help but, at least in a roundabout way, confess her love for him as well. It were as possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you, but believe me not, and yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. And so then they find out that they love each other. But as they come together in their intimacy and love, Benedict says, Come, bid me do anything for thee. He's ready to go to the end of the world for her because he loves her so much. And of course, in this moment, she's still got all those feelings that she's just had about Claudio. And so she tells him, kill Claudio, his close friend Claudio. Benedict balks for a moment, and she sees that he doesn't truly love her. But Benedict is just trying to get the story straight. Are you sure that Claudio meant this? Are you sure he's not wronged about this? Beatrice says, is he not approved in the height of villain that has slandered, scorned, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man! What bear her in hand until they came to take hands, and then, with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor, oh God, that I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Beatrice longs to be a man, to step out of her role so that she can do what she longs to do, which is face down Claudio for the shame he brought on her cousin. 
A moment later she says, I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. She calls indirectly for Benedict to be a man, to be the friend he said he would be to her, and stand up against Claudio and the shame that Claudio brought on Hero. Benedict says, Think you in your soul the Count Claudio hath wronged Hero? And Beatrice says, Yea, as sure as I have a thought, or a soul. And Benedict says, Enough, I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand, and so leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. It's a pretty potent scene, and definitely shows a deep intimacy between the two characters, which challenges the notion that they're otherwise just thrown into these roles of lovers against their will. Even if they are coerced into it, this feels real. In scene two of Act Four, we return to Dogberry, who is trying to interview the two prisoners as the sexton writes down their answers. Unfortunately, Dogberry is the worst examiner ever. He's completely stumped when both prisoners claim that they are not false knaves. Fortunately for him, the sexton advises that the watch who captured them go ahead and give their testimony. When the watch say what they overheard, the sexton says, ah, well, they can't deny it because that happened this very morning. Claudio did defame Hero at the wedding, and she died because of it. Baraccio, at least, seems to be a little overcome by guilt at this and the sexton advises that they take the prisoners to Leonato. Conrad calls Dogberry an ass, which Dogberry takes deeply to heart. He wishes that the sexton were still there to write him down an ass, something that he harps on throughout the rest of the play. He's deeply hurt by the defamation, but he wants it noted. He wants to be written down and marked that way, so that all will know what he's been called. Dost thou not suspect my place? Dost thou not suspect my years? Oh, that he were here to write me down an ass! But masters, remember that I am an ass. Though it be not written down, yet forget not that I am an ass. No, thou villain, thou art full of piety, as shall be proved upon thee by good witness. I am a wise fellow, and which is more, an officer, and which is more, a householder, and which is more, as pretty a piece of flesh as any in Messina, and one that knows the law go to, and a rich fellow enough go to, and a fellow that hath had losses, and one that hath two gowns, and everything handsome about him, bring him away. Oh, that I had been writ down an ass. And so we come to Act 5. Antonio and Leonato are still dealing with the repercussions of everything. Leonato can't let go of his intense emotions. And Antonio advises that he take them out on those who wronged his daughter, Claudio and Don Pedro. Notice at this point that Leonato has not found out the innocence of his daughter, but he's begun to claim it both because the shame is otherwise too much to bear. While at first his anger at his shame was directed at his daughter, now he's directed the opposite direction at Claudio and Don Pedro. When Don Pedro and Claudio enter, Antonio and Leonardo both challenge them to duels, and Claudio and Don Pedro mock them as old, as old helpless men. Notice the complete contrast from the first scene, where everyone was bending over backwards to show honor and respect and hospitality. Now we're spitting insults back and forth, and doing everything they can to shame each other. When Leonardo and Antonio exit, Benedict enters. Claudio and Don Pedro are glad to see Benedict because they want him to cheer them up. They're bummed. High proof melancholy, as Claudio says. But Benedict isn't there to use his wit to cheer them up. Rather, he's there to challenge Claudio. Both Don Pedro and Claudio seem a bit stunned by Benedict's change and assume that it must come from having fallen in love with Beatrice. Benedict exits, and in comes Dogberry, taking the prisoners to Leonato. Don Pedro can't get a straight answer out of Dogberry, so he turns and asks Baraccio what happened. Baraccio confesses all, because at this point he's feeling very guilty. And Claudio and Don Pedro are horrified to realize what they've done. In comes Leonato, having just heard from the sexton what happened. And he demands to look into the eyes of Baraccio, saying, Art thou the slave that with thy breath hath killed my innocent child? Baraccio says, Yea, even I alone. Leonato says, No, not so, villain. Thou beliest thyself. Here stand a pair of honorable men, the third is fled that had a hand in it. I thank you, princes, for my daughter's death, record it with your high and worthy deeds, t'was bravely done, if you bethink you of it. Notice the way that he twists their honor, their use of language to kill his daughter, the most shameful thing they could have done, defame her and destroy her. He wrenches around and says, that's what your honor is. Claudio and Don Pedro both submit themselves to Leonardo, saying, Whatever revenge you desire, we will submit ourselves to it. Leonardo says, I cannot bid you bid my daughter live. That were impossible. 
but I pray you both possess the people in Messina here, how innocent she died, and if your love can labor aught in sad invention, hang an epitaph on her tomb, and sing it to her bones, sing it tonight. Tomorrow morning come you to my house, and since you cannot be my son-in-law, yet be my nephew. My brother hath a daughter, almost the copy of my child that's dead, and she alone is heir to both of us. Give her the right you should have given her cousin, and so dies my revenge. He asks Claudio to clear Hero's name and to sing an epitaph at her tomb, and then to marry his niece without seeing her. Claudio accepts this very generous response, and Baraccio, who is still guilt-ridden, tries to clear Margaret's name, telling how she did not know what was going on. Meanwhile, Benedict in the Orchard is trying to write love songs and love poems to Beatrice, and doing a really terrible job of it. In comes Beatrice, and they flirt somewhat badly, with lots of jibes at each other. Benedict tells Beatrice how he has challenged Claudio, and she deeply appreciates it. But just at that moment, Ursula runs up with the news, how Don John has run away, and how all has been exposed. Scene 3 is Claudio going before Hero's tomb and singing the epitaph. In scene 4, Leonardo is preparing his family for the new wedding ceremony, where Claudio is supposed to marry his niece, who's really Hero again in disguise. Benedict then says to the friar that he wants also to marry Beatrice in the same ceremony, and Leonardo chuckles and cryptically mentions the trick, which Benedict pauses at but doesn't understand. In comes Claudio solemn, and swears to marry the woman that Leonardo has asked him to marry. She unmasks, revealing that she's really Hero, and when I lived, I was your other wife. And when you loved, you were my other husband. When Claudio says, another hero, she says, nothing certainer. One hero died defiled, but I do live. And surely as I live, I am a maid. In the happy reunion, Benedict steps forward and asks for Beatrice. She unveils herself. And Benedict, before everyone, says, do not you love me? Beatrice, in front of everybody, says, why, no, no more than reason. Benedict says, well... I, I overheard them talking about how much you love me. And Beatrice says, do not you love me? And Benedict says, troth, no, no more than reason. <clears throat> and Beatrice says, well, I overheard Margaret and Ursula and Hero talking about you. They swore that you were almost sick for me. They swore that you were well nigh dead for me. And so the two discover the trick and realize that they're not in love with each other. Or maybe not for show. But Claudio pulls out the love sonnet that Benedict had been writing for Beatrice. And Hero pulls out the love poetry that Beatrice had been writing for Benedict. And because their own poetry exposes their feelings, they realize that yes, they are in love. And so they do marry after all. And Benedict calls them all to dance, and advises Don Pedro to go ahead and get himself a wife as well. If you want your Shakespeare lighthearted and cheerful, this is one of the best plays for it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Bye bye.